Hello, everybody, and welcome to my show, William Steele, True Crime, on YouTube and my new podcast that's going to be put out simultaneously across all platforms. I'd like to thank my fans for joining us on the A&E reality show, Inmate to Roommate. The show shot up to be one of the top reality shows in the country. I'm honored to be a part of it, and I'm grateful for A&E. And Joe Ruser, my producer, Joe, shout out to Joe, uh, nominated for an Emmy Award in another matter, but uh, in Sharp Entertainment. Thank you for including me. As you know, my true crime show focuses on people with reformed lives who've ch- turned their life around. We've had several people on here uh, that have come out of backgrounds like mine, incarceration, doing the wrong thing, and really have turned those experiences around, saw the light for whatever reason, and had to change the heart, and now trying to do something positive with their platforms. And so without further ado, you guys know my story. Thank you for following Inmate to Roommate, my books. Um, you know the books I've written about uh, Glenn Maxwell and Robert Durst. I want to introduce my guest today, Bill Stacks from Chatting with Stacks YouTube channel across all social media platform. He's got a background um, very similar. He's done some time. He's, uh, I believe, involved with gangs back in the day. And so the man does nothing but help people now and puts out really positive shows. And uh, he has fun with his shows, though, I tell you what. And he's been somewhat of a mentor to me. Uh, We were introduced by a mutual acquaintance uh, in the beginning of my journey with this since being released from prison. He's kind of helped me understand the editing process. And so I'm grateful for him. I'm pleased to have him on my show. Bill? What's up, man? (laughs) All right. How you doing? Good to have you on. I'm good. Thank you for having me on, man. I really appreciate it. No problem. So we've done shows together before, mostly. You're always interviewing me about my projects and stuff. And I and I know you have a journey where you've turned your life around. And so yeah. I'd like you, for my audience and my fans, because literally I have millions of fans right now. I'm blessed. Um, my fan pages, if you go to Facebook from the show, Inmate to Roommate, there's, I don't know, tens of thousands of them just there alone on all these other channels. Uh, for people who may not know who Bill Stacks is or serve my shows with you, tell me a little bit about yourself, your background, and how you came to do chatting with Stacks on YouTube. Yeah, man. So um, my background is I was born and raised in Bristol, Connecticut. I was born in 79. Um, I just had my mother growing up, my uh, brother and sister, and uh, I was always into getting in trouble when I was younger, you know, causing mischief, normal uh young teenage stuff like that and um it progressed man i started getting in trouble with the law and getting arrested and um i went to uh a place called myi it's uh they call it little cheshire gladiator school where you you know you it's like us it's like a little prison for kids right and that's i went there and you know i i went full force into the life of crime and um i was involved with gangs i ended up joining a gang called 20 love in connecticut and what year was what year year was that how old were you then when you joined the gang i was about 14 and um this was in the 90s this was uh around 93 94 this was uh a, a lot of gangs in the area where i lived and uh, a lot of Latin Kings, 20 Love, Los Salidos. There was a lot of different gangs, but they were um, jockeying for power, a lot of gang fights and people were getting shot and things. It was escalating. The crimes that we were doing were escalating. You know, we went from stealing cars and then to burglarizing people's houses. Right. And um, I was in and out of prison for a long time, man. But before, I went to prison. I had a a incident with the gang and I got lured to a park and we we were allegedly going to meet some girls there. And one of the people turned around and hit me and we start fighting and all these dudes just rush me and they're stomping me, man. And this isn't like a back trail in a park. So no one knew we were there. No one's breaking this up. Right. I don't know how long it happened for, but they were beating me down pretty bad. And uh, when they were finished, they took my shoe off and threw it in my face and then left. And I just picked myself up. I was all bloody and I I walked home. And uh, they sent a girl over to my house to talk to me. 
because a lot of the people, I was really tight with a lot of them, and I was carrying guns for them. Like, I was the person who would hold the guns. Right. And, and before they did all this, they didn't get the guns from me. Uh. So now they want the guns back, you know? So, but I'm not giving them up. No. And I'm like, no, I'm that's, not. That's payment for the beatdown. Yeah, it. you guys messed up. Like, you guys messed <laughs> up, and that's it. Like, they wanted me to come back. They, they, one of them was like, oh, we made a mistake. One of the higher ups from the people who did this, they were like, they made a mistake. We're going to just sweep this under the rug. Um, everyone's going to get a bounce, and then we're going to move on. I was like, nah, it's not going to work like that. I'm walking away. I'm done with this shit. Because I sense a lot of um, a lot of treachery, a lot of jealousy in there. A lot of, a lot of times they were fighting amongst each other. Right. And it's like, why don't you take that energy that you have fighting with each other and fight against people who are fighting against us? Because we're fighting all these enemies on the street, and then we got to worry about each other, too. Internal beefs and, and treachery. <clears throat> it is a bunch of bullshit, man. And then you got other people in the organization doing drugs, and it was just it was just uh, not adding up to what I thought it was going to be, right. you know? <clears throat> so I ended up walking away. So then I have to go to prison un unaffiliated with the gang, so... It wasn't easy, but I think I made the right choice by leaving the gang before I went to prison. Right. You know, um, about how about it, how long did you serve at that at that time? The first time was two years. Right. The second time, I think it was eighteen months, and then it would just be sporadic, um, sporadic sentences. I'd get probation. I'd have nine months suspended. I'd have to serve nine months on that. And then I'd get out. I'd be on probation. I'd have three years suspended. I'd end up violating. I'd go back to prison for that. They'd let me out. They'd put me on something else. I'd go to a drug program. I'd violate that. I'd go back. Right. And it was constant, man. It was like nonstop. It wasn't going to stop. I have a picture here I could show you um, when I was young i went to prison and my mother would visit me every time they had a visit and things like that and uh this was at the gardner gardner correctional facility back in i think it was 97 it might have been 97 or 96 somewhere around there right and uh this place was wild when i was in there so it it, it was a level four prison back then it was a gang unit so they had, I think it was five different pods. Now, the pods are cells on the bottom, cells on the top, right. uh, six showers. <laughs> and so I walk in there. I'm a young kid, man. I go from Little Cheshire to this place, right? And I was scared. I'm not going to lie. Like, I just got my TV back. Like, because when they transferred me, I go from segregation right. to a level four gang prison. And I'm like... <laughs> this is crazy. I'm walking in there with my my thing, and I'm looking at all these people. Like, damn man, this is like what you see on TV. Right. Like these people don't <clears throat> look normal. They're so big. Like from working out, right. that it's like I'm sure you've seen it. I've seen it in New York prison. The guy's arms are about this big around, but then they got the prison workout legs that are about that skinny. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Their their arms are like cute. You're just like, what the? Fuck? I gotta fight this guy. Like, come on, man. <laughs> Yeah, and then their legs are like this skinny. They're like two little legs, right? Yeah, two yep, big yep. legs. A lot of that in prison. I've noticed a lot of that. A lot of people work on their upper body, right. and none of them work on their legs. Right. Yeah, I've seen that a lot. They call them chicken legs. Yep. Uh, <laughs> so uh, that was my first experience with tree jumpers. Right. We were talking about that earlier. And um, when I first heard that expression, because I went from a little... I went from Little Cheshire, which was like kind of like a junior prison, you can call it. It was pretty severe there, though. Right. Like, let's not skip over the treachery that happened at Little Cheshire because it was bad. <clears throat> and because the kids had a lot of time to do things and they would do pretty wild things. They would put stuff in your food. They would uh, put nair on your eyebrows if you oh, were well. sleeping or something. They just <laughs> wiped it on and then it would. 
crazy things like that, man. Right. They would change your shampoo bottle. Well, I think there. I think you're talking about that uh, that uh, that not necessarily Nair. It was it that white stuff that some people shave with. That powder. What is it called? No, no, it's Nair. It's it's <laughs> how they it's get like Nair. How they get Nair in a man's pr- in a man's prison? <laughs> they had it on the commissary. You wipe it on you, and then you you scrape it like this, and it just takes your hair off. Wow. And the kids in there had it, and they were wiping it on people, <clears throat> like wiping it on their eyebrows and th- things like that. It was crazy. What's man. the worst thing you saw during time? Like, what have you seen? Extreme violence there, or you know, you know, we all know what. I spoke down. about this before. One of the one of the craziest things I've seen in prison. One time in Little Cheshire, I saw this kid get his hand pressed into this uh, a heat press for the so the. You wear these uh, jumpsuits, and you have your name and inmate number right. heat press onto the oh, jumpsuit, like melted on. Yeah, yeah. My job was to press. It's like a machine. You clamp it down, and it heats up, and right. it and it melts the glue and back of these little uh, tags on the jumpsuits. So these kids are like, "Yo, go watch the door." I wasn't a gang member then because right. I got out of the gang, right? So I'm watching the door, and they grab this kid, and they put his hand down, and they and they clamp the press down on his hand. I don't know what he did, man, but I didn't want no parts of it. Wow. So, yeah. And and the main rule in prison is you don't know nothing. If something's going on, look the other way. Yeah. And you don't know nothing. Yeah. Like, so, so how was your family feeling during this period? Obviously, they're worried about you. You look like your mom was standing by. You know, mom's always going to be there. So what, she kind of, was, what kind of drama did you put your family through that maybe you started, you started looking, examining the damage you're doing to your family and the people that love you that aren't involved with the lifestyle, but they're always worried they're going to get a call from the cops that you arrested or you died or you got killed. or Tell, yeah, me, about, tell me about your family drama with this. So my mother came to visit me all the time. This was around this time. And uh, one time she came to visit me and I had a black eye, right? Oh, wow. And she's like, what happened to you? And I'm like, nothing, nothing. I'm trying to shrug it, shrug it off. You don't want to tell your mother you got in a fight right. and blah, blah, blah. Right. You don't want to worry her. So the person that I got into the fight with was in the visiting room oh. at the time. So it's set up like uh, where you're just sitting at these cubicles and you're, you're looking straight ahead. There's a glass window with a phone because right. there were non-contact visits where I was at. <clears throat> so... The person was a couple a couple over down there, and I could turn like this and see him, right? So my mother goes, "Listen, you, because I was always looking for acceptance. Once once it's okay for me to do it, okay, I'm gonna go all in. Right. So I was really uh, trying to avoid confrontation for the most part, and uh, when I went." To that visit with the black eye, my mother's like, Bill, when you are in a situation and they're pressing you about something or whatever's going on, when you feel that that scaredness in you and you feel like, you know, you're scared and, and you want to do something, mm-hmm. she's like, just lash out at him. Just go. Just <laughs> just let him have it. And I'm like, OK, I got permission, man. Oh, my God. So right when she left the visit, man. Right when she walked out of the door and it closed, That's, I went, you saw your chance. I went <laughs> after him, bro. And he was on his visit. I didn't care. Right. He got and, your revenge, uh, and especially because you had a situation where your mother had to see you like that. Yeah, <laughs> and it, it made me feel like, like, damn, like, he got me. Right, you know? right, right, right. But not today. Right. I ended up fighting him in front of his people, and his people are banging on the window, and they can't do nothing. I suckered him too, man. Good. <laughs> oh, excuse hey. me, not good. I don't encourage violence, but under the circumstances, I, I know where you're coming from. Because probably when it happened, he had his buddies around, and you know they got more opportunity to do more harm to you in that situation. Yeah, they try, man. And you know, a lot of them are. A lot of it is sell gangsters. A lot of them like to talk shit. That's right. It me. reminds me so much of the internet, man. Because oh, a lot man. of these people. They see you in person, they won't do shit. No. You know, they talk a good one, but they ain't going to do nothing. With my show, Inmate to Roommate, you know, it's so so popular. And I picked up a few people, 98% of the people are super supportive. I get guys that are out of prison, even women, 
saying they're, you know, we're real proud of you, you got a show, you're writing books, you're trying to help people. But other ones who don't know what the struggle's like or friends with the people I live with are saying the most horrible things that are lie-based. And it's like, I'm not used to this. This social media didn't exist when I went to prison 18 years ago. Okay? Yeah, people, I, I'm people, a recovering drug addict, man. I get the hate all the time. People, all of right. You know, you're full of shit. You're still getting high, but I, I, I already know. So in my case, I know that I have never been as clean as I am right now, probably in my entire life. You know, from you know, as I've been the last 18 months, which for me is a great track record because I was like you. I was in and out, and I'm And if I was on parole, I was busy getting high still on coke. Now I didn't drink. Trying to sneak around the urines, right? Yeah. Try to figure a way around it. Man, one time, I, I you know, I'll tell you a story real quick. I uh, was doing that, that that Golden Seal from GNC. I was doing the <laughs> quick caps and all this stuff, but I was on a cocaine binge for weeks. This is the 90s. And I was on parole, man. And, and uh, then I was doing that, and I was putting, like, bleach in the sample and this and that. So, like, you know, my last day of supervision, they pissed test you on your final day. <clears throat> and the, the right away, I put it there, and the key says to me, where's the bleach? <laughs> I said, where's the bleach? He said, man, I smell it. And you see this. Did it work? Did any of that stuff you did work? Nothing worked. The only thing that ever worked in those days was tons and tons of water. Tons of water. And then, you know. See, you do all this stuff and you think you're going to beat the test and it doesn't even work. The only thing you're doing is fooling yourself and making your life worse, violating. They know you're lying. Bottom line, they brought in the supervisors. They said, what's the first thing you notice about that sample? Supervisors, all the other people that walked in the room said, he put bleach in the, sa- in the sample. Because bleach will leave bubbles all over the urine sample on the sides of the cup, like a fizz stuck to the walls of the cup. Urine by itself leaves the fizz up on top of the sample. When you see it stuck to the walls, you know there's bleach in the sample. So wow, they look see? for that. They look for that. They look for the smell. I was fooling nobody but myself, man. And so, you know, it's been like almost 20 years since I last touched cocaine. So, But, yeah, you'll have people who think, like, my crimes were, like, a few weeks ago. Man, my past is, like, almost 20 <laughs> years ago. I've taken college yeah. courses. I've been, you know, doing all kinds of positive stuff. They don't acknowledge any of that. But just be guys like me and you doing positive things. Sean Atwood, shout out. Atwood, Atwood man, great guy, man. Been to prison. He's one of the biggest true crime guys helping people on the internet right now. Steve, Steve Gillian too. Steve Gillian. Steve Gillian. Uh, raw media. Uh, who's who's the other one we know? Uh, Ciro DePazio. Ciro, <clears throat> yeah. He ran in you know organized crime lifestyle, gang lifestyle. Uh, you know I don't like to give names out to the gangs because it just you know gives credence to, to some negative stuff. But so he's turned his life around. He's making movies now. So people that naysay me. You know, I got it on my thing where no matter what I do, you can't seem to please everybody, one. People are going to hide behind a keyboard, two. They're going to talk shit that they'd never say to your face. And, you know, I got in trouble for responding to one of them on Messenger because this dude, this whacked out dude was baiting me up. And, yeah, I fell for it. I said, listen, you're a coward hiding behind a keyboard. I have a show on TV. I'm helping people. What are you doing with your life besides harassing somebody who's never bothered you on the Internet? You know, I said, you're a, bi- you know, a bitch and a coward. He yeah. reports me to the administrator, gets me thrown off the group. You know, so this is the kind of people you're dealing with, straight up cowards and people that don't even know you talking crap about you. And I'm learning to deal with the network, A and E network gave me some guidance about how to deal with these people. And I'm starting to follow it now. I didn't want to listen to anybody in the beginning, but now I understand you really have to ignore them. You have to just let it go. You have to moderate your comments a little bit. You know, Mary, my fiance, she's wonderful. She's been teaching me all along how to deal with it. So let's get to the next stage. So you get it out of prison. What what was your change of heart experience? Maybe it was a couple of things that said, man, I got to change my life and do something positive. I, I want to help people. I want to do a show. What happened? So like life? I said, I was uh, into drugs a lot, man. I was in and out of prison. I started getting into cocaine and uh, heroin. Alcohol was a major problem in my life. I would drink every day. Right. I got into, um, you know, drinking vodka every day, shaking in the morning just to function. And then I got into the heroin and the cocaine and everything else. And um, I overdosed a bunch of times on drugs. And um, those were wake up calls. And then my friends started dying around me. What year was this starting to really go downhill where you started to see your rock bottom? Probably about. Six years ago, about six years ago. Okay. 
people started dying around me. I had a roommate die. I had, um, people were passing away and, uh, other people, I see other people from my past that have, you know, wife, kids, they got their life together and I'm just stuck in this hole. Right. And, um, I used to look at myself like I was a victim. Like I, <laughs> Oh, I'm stuck in this situation. I don't deserve this and all this. I used to be the victim, right. you know, right. and I went that way for a long time. I, I, I would, uh, feel sorry for myself a lot. Okay. I'd be homeless, sitting in a tent, not doing nothing with myself. Right. Like, and, um, the change really happened when um, there was one conversation I had with a lady. Her name is Pat Stebbins. She helped me out a lot. And if you guys don't know who she is, she runs an organization called Brian's Angels, where they help homeless people out here in my community. Right. She's one of the people who helped me when I was in my active addiction. And um, she helped me with just giving me conversation. She looked at me like a normal person. Right. Like I was still savable and that I still had a heart and I was still, and, and I believed her when she would talk to me. And, um, I started to apply myself, man. Like people don't understand how bad it was for me. Like I wanted to die every day. I right. didn't want to live. I, I had no ambition in life. I didn't care about myself. I hated myself. And um, I had to work on myself a lot, man. It wasn't easy, but I'm going to tell you guys out there, it's worth it. A hundred percent, it's worth it. Absolutely. Absolutely. You know, I, I am a Christian. I'm not a Bible thumper type Christian, but I do have a strong faith. And I believe what they say in Christianity, this joy and sin for a season. All that stuff was enjoyable in its time, but in the end is misery. Misery, loss, sacrifice, years lost in prison, separation from family, all the things that matter, the ability to build a family relationship. So none of it's worth it. I don't glorify my past, and I've been through a lot of the things you, that you're that relating to us right now. And, uh, you know, one of the main people that even now, I made a change really in prison because it was more about my mother was mentally ill, my sister's taking advantage of that, me looking at my life and saying, you know, let me write books. I want to help people taking college courses. But... My fiance, Mary, she has really talked to me the same way that that lady spoke to you. You know, she really believes in me, and she stood there by me. In a, and uh, I only met her shortly before I got released, but it's like a breath of fresh air to have somebody in your life besides all the negativity in prison coming at you and the administration. Yeah. You know, very few and far between decent administrators but, or, or officers. You know, there's, there's a few handful of them. But her, it's like, wow, it's a completely different person than I'm used to being with. And she was very thoughtful and encouraging. And she said, I don't care about your past. I care, you know, who you are today and that you have a heart to help people. And, you know, she's, she's past even my current imperfections. You know, I'm still working out some bugs with my personality sometimes. But, uh, you know, it means a lot to have that person in your life. You know, and in your case, I guess that lady, she, what was her name? Uh, Pat Stebbins. She still does it every day, man. She, every single day. I go down there and volunteer when I have time. I'll, she probably I'll uh, volunteer past. for a few hours, hand out lunches and things like that. She probably had a past too. Maybe she was incarcerated or a drug problem. No, no. So, no, she doesn't have a past like that. Her son was in active oh. addiction. He ended up committing suicide. And that's how she got turned on to doing this type of stuff. Right. And, um, you know, that's that's wonderful. I'm she's so an sorry. angel, man. God sent. She's we, God sent. Maybe I could have her on my show one day, too. And, uh, you know, shout out to her and the difference she's making in people's lives. I've met a lot of people like that where nobody pays attention, really, to somebody's addiction or struggles with incarceration. And, and Yo, good luck with getting an interview. I haven't got one yet, and I've been trying. <laughs> <laughs> I've been asking her and asking her, but she's so busy. Like, I'll, I'll bring you down there one time. I'll have you on a live, and uh, I'll show you her operation. You'll be like, damn, she does a lot, man. You know what a lot of our fans don't realize? that Because we're doing this, and we're very public, so we're taking some abuse on the back channels a little bit. And yeah. you, you haven't changed. You're a con artist. You're the, you know, I was like, where are these people even saying this for? They don't even know me, at, you know, where I've been. You might be talking about the bill I was 20 years ago. Not yeah, maybe, maybe you know the guy I was five years ago, but <laughs> right. you don't know the guy right. I am now. Right. Any of these people who say they know me, I, 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 uh, people out there that say they really know me, I challenge you to, uh, 
Show me who I really am, though, because I know who I am today. I, I put a positive step forward, and I'll do anything to help a person who's trying to help themselves. I, I think you know? two things come from these positions. I guess they call them trolls that, that mess with us online. And I don't have that many, and it's usually the same few under different profiles. It usually comes from a place of the self-hatred of themselves. Their lives are so miserable. Let me lash out on this person or that person or... The second thing is I think the media in many ways is responsible because in the media, if it bleeds, it leads. So they love to show stories of guys like us who got out and shot the police, guys like us who got out and did some crazy crime. And so Do you know the, how they, many people the are wishing for me to relapse and exactly my downfall? Right. It's like, why would you wish that on someone? Exactly. Even if you don't like me, why would you wish that on me, right. man? It's a miserable, depressing, horrible life, and nobody wants that. I wouldn't want that for a family member, for you, for me, ever again. <laughs> they, they don't get it, but the media never, ever, I can't say never, but almost never discusses stories like ours, stories of success having come out of prison and completely turned it around, not just laying low and blending into society, but putting yourself out there to help other people. You know, yeah. they don't talk about guys like us, you know, and so the they public don't. thinks every one of us that gets out is going to do something stupid or horrendous or can't be trusted. But if you get arrested for something, you guarantee oh, they're going to talk about that. Yeah, play that up real good. So you had to change your heart. You had people OD around you. You were going through a lot. You were homeless. You met this lady. So this is a few years ago, and then you decided to do this what? This is almost that? four years ago, uh, <laughs> September 14th, okay. 2019, I believe it was. No, 2018 is my clean date, man. So do you still have a, a causal relationship at all with any of your former friends, gang members, or did you just decide, let me cut, the, let me cut it right now? Uh, well, cor cordial. What's up as on it, the internet? Yeah, as in thing, you say hello, you, know? you tolerate each other, but you're really not feeling them or they're... You know, maybe a few, nah. maybe a few of them are out of it. And wish you the best. They want to see something. Yeah, no, the people who who were in it and they're out now, because the the gang that I was in disbanded many many years ago. Right. And the people who were in the gang I was in are either dead in jail or they're in they were in other gangs. But they, there still are a lot of gangs out here, and they, um, they probably, I still see people who are my rival gangs and. The rival gang members, one of them just passed away, matter of fact. Rest oh. in peace to uh, Gabe. Um, but all of it's, uh, I mean, some of them probably still hold grudges, and I don't blame them because I did a lot of bad things right. back in the day, man. I, I was going to I was gonna make a little joke because my New York sarcasm. I was going to say, your gang disbanded because you stole all their guns. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I, they weren't happy about but, that. But man. no, so I look at it like this. Me having done time when I was a law clerk, you know, everybody wants to point finger at everybody else. Well, to my understanding, what I've noticed is so many of the leaders, and I'm never going to name a gang because I don't want to stir up drama. A lot of the leaders end up cooperating with the prison investigators and the outside authorities while they're still getting these newer, younger guys to commit the crimes for them. And then when a shit hits the fan... They're the ones getting the deal for five years while this guy's getting 30 years, the underlings. Yeah, it doesn't make sense. It's like, and, or, or they'll say, hey, New York, I talked to you privately. You can't say nothing to my homeboys. You know, I'll, I'll lift you up or, you know, but listen, you know, I, I run this clique or this set. But I made a deal on the street. I told on a murder up in New York or in California or this or that. And, <laughs> and, and, and they reneged on my deal. They didn't give me what I was supposed to get, the prosecutors. How can I go back to court? And I'm like... Aren't you the guy running around here calling everybody else a snitch and calling me, you know, cracker and all this? Look, you need to cut the bullshit, turn your life around. What can I do to help? But at the same time, you, the same ones pointing finger at everybody else and coming and saying, I didn't get my deal and I cooperated. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> I've seen Yo, it once, so many times. Once, once things started getting, uh, once I got sober... Yeah. And I was like, how can I take all this stuff that I've been through, this pain and misery and, and uh, going to prison and all this, my experience, how can I turn this into something positive? Right. That's what I was thinking of. And I'm like, probably about eight months took me to figure it out. And I was like, I'm going to start a podcast. I was going to start it with one of my friends. I was supposed to start it with, with this kid I know. And um, we were throwing the idea around, but he always... Uh, he was always detoxing on something or, you know, he's, something was he's going not, he's on not with ready. him. He's not ready. No. So I was like, screw it, man. I'm going to do it by myself. Right. So I started reaching out to people, 
Mr. Ramundi is the first person who got back in touch with me. We started talking. Uh, we built a friendship. I've interviewed him probably a hundred times. Um, I've had him on quite a bit, man. And uh, I've had on other big names. Uh, Lyle Menendez, uh, Larry Mazza, Frank Calabrese Jr., Dave Icavetti, Ciro DiPaggio. There's so many. Um, I've had actors on. I've had... Uh, Ignacio, play, Ignacio Esteban. A Ignacio Esteban. <laughs> I've had Playboy Playmates on. Okay. Um, Deborah. Deborah, um, I forgot her last name. She was on. Uh, Big Angie's sister was on my show. I Tons heard about the show, but it was all out when I was incarcerated, so I still have a lot to catch up on, man. I just got out after over 18 years. so Yeah, the Mob Wives and all that. Big I, still, I haven't seen sister. any of that. Janine. Janine. Shout out to Janine and Dominic. They were both on my show. I've had inmates from prison with their cell phones in the cell. Oh, no. Chatting with me. Right. Um, Things like that. I try to... I try to think outside the box when I do this, and I try not to do what everyone else is doing. And you can tell if you watch really close, people people really watch what I do, and they take bits and pieces from me. I can tell who does what, I can but see it's okay. You have, you have phenomenal <laughs> editing skills, and you're not old enough probably to remember who Wolfman Jack was. But you have that voice, that deep, <laughs> gravelly voice, man. <laughs> and he was super famous radio guy back in the yeah. day, Wolfman Jack. So I teased my girl, and she, she didn't know who he was, but I, but I let her hear him. She's like, holy crap, yeah. it sounds just like Bill Stacks. <laughs> yeah, a lot of people tell me I have a good radio voice or a, a good voice for voiceovers or something like that. It's very, like very that. unique. It's a very unique sound. So you're doing the positive stuff. You're doing a lot of true crime stuff. You're doing a lot of stuff on reform, lives, and redemption uh, stories. So where where are you going now in the future? What are you what are your plans going forward with your show and with your life? I think you said you mentioned possibly a book. Yeah, so I'm working on a book right now. It should be done within uh, two months. It's it's a story about my life, right. and um, so I'm going to be putting that out in the next two months. And then I'm working on being involved with different series. I want to be in like different Netflix series and things like that. Can't really talk about which ones. But um, I'm going to be in a couple different series coming up next year. And uh, I want to get into acting and see what I could do there, man. And maybe produce documentaries and things like that. I like to do different things. I did. Uh, I worked on something with Bill Crook's Partners in Crime. Okay. Uh, we, we did a thing about uh, Albert Anastasia. It was kind of like a mini documentary about him. He's got he a did, uh, something called Extraordination, I think the podcast is called. Yeah, it's not that. It's something else besides oh, that. Okay. But we worked on it together. And uh, it was just a story of um, Albert Anastasia. And we're going to put together different things. Me and Bill have a show on Thursdays called The Greatest, Mafia, Greatest Hits in the Mafia on Thursday nights at 8 o'clock. It's usually me, Bill Crooks, and uh, William Oldsfield. That's and on we talk chat, of, chatting with Stacks. I know you do uh, Mugshot Mondays. Yeah, Mugshot <laughs> Monday is with Zay, me and Zay at 3 o'clock on Monday. And then uh, Tuesday, Wednesday are just, you know, I free, I free freestyle it. Okay. And then Thursday <laughs> is uh, Mafia's Greatest Hits with Bill Crooks and Bill Oldsfield. And we break down the whole Mafia from the beginning to the end. You know who's a real uh, uh, encyclopedic knowledge of the mafia? Uh, boy from South Carolina. You know, you know who it is. Hollywood Wade. Crime yeah, shout out to Hollywood Wade, man. Crime and Entertainment. All these Network. guys. Subscribe. So, to, chatting with Stacks, Crime and Entertainment. And, there uh, wasn't this many shows. When I first came out, there wasn't this many shows. There was about, there was about a handful, man. There wasn't barely any. Right. There was John A. Light and... I think it was Michael Francis. Sammy wasn't even out when I first came out. Right. It's amazing because some of the topics everybody's just talking so freely about now would have got people killed back in the 70s. <laughs> you know? Yeah, it's crazy, man. <laughs> there's no there's no loyalty that I can see in anybody anymore. You know, you have to look out for yourself, for your family, 
and not bother joining these criminal organizations that are going to make you do <laughs> illegal things to fit in or be part of this clique when you can do your own thing. You know, I was a and one thing I want to bring up, man, because a lot of people are like, you're involved with the drama, you're in the bullshit, blah, blah, blah. I want to explain why I do what I do. It's because I will expose Sammy the Bull, Michael Francis, any any of them. If you come on here and you're acting, you you did all this stuff in your past, right? You were a gangster, you were this and that. But then you flipped, you became a rat. And then you want to come on YouTube and act like you're this gangster. Right. That shit don't fly with me, bro. Right. So I'm going to break down exactly what you are. And uh, we're going to see what the people think of it. You got to be careful. One of them might sue you one day for putting their life in danger. <laughs> so I wouldn't be careful with that. So, Bring it on, man. I mean, they're, they're already putting themselves out there and a lot of stuff that they did. Um, I don't know. I don't get involved with the drama, but <laughs> I, I see sometimes you get into that that, that area. But uh, Hey, man, you so got to stick up for the people without voices. I put uh, Rhea Monday on, on my show, and some people complained about that. But, you know, my, my fiance, she's a forensic accountant, and she's a civilian fraud examiner. And she was able to find a genealogy link with him to Lucky Luciano, literally, yeah, no bloodline. And then uh, also a link, uh, we found something with FBI documents that shows he is on official FBI paperwork as being an associate of La Casa Nostra, a mob, I believe it even says Colombo family on it. So, <laughs> Yeah, he, he was in uh, one of the bus with Sonny, Fran Sonny, uh, Sonny Francis. He was on the same indictment with him. Right. And not a, not a lot of people are real visible in what they did when they were criminals, and they're just now talking about it. Now, he's an older guy now with some health issues, and he's had a change of heart. He went on my show explaining what changed his mind towards that lifestyle. Now, he doesn't get out there throwing people under the bus. He doesn't. And that's the difference. Right. He that talks about it, and he talks about generalities, and he talks about his own shit. And so, I, you know, he's... But when you come on here and you're... Uh... You're getting arrested for stalking. You're you're assaulting women in the beach in Florida. You got videos of you smashing doors in and things like that. I'm gonna expose you. Yeah, so and I saw one of your guests last week. You had on that, that had some of those issues. So what are you, you hoping to do? Your uh, you got these these webcasts going now. I don't know anything about that either because I'm new at this. But somebody said I could even do like a web series or Netflix. I was working to bring my first book into a drama series. I had an A-list screen, screenwriter working on it, Bettina Zillowal. She died of cancer. So I have interest. Since my show, Inmate to Roommate, became so popular, I've been offered four movie roles, all of them legitimate movie roles. Are you going to take them? I've been offered you know, work, a work up towards a drama series with my life. Um, yeah, I don't, I don't aspire to be an actor, but why not? It's a better platform for me to sell books. And if it lets me be myself more than acting, I think it'll come off good because I'm sarcastic. People think I'm funny. And so, I know. You are funny, man. You got a witty personality. You're quick with it, you know? Yeah. So, you know, why not? I'll do it. One of them, uh, one of them they offered me, because I was a jewel thief, they want me to play a, a, a Jewish jeweler in a New York mob movie. So, <laughs> I, can see that. I, I think I can pull that off really easily, so... Hell yeah, bro. Wearing uh, the Star David right here. Right? Yeah, I have my yarmulke on, you know. My... Yeah. Be perfect. <laughs> perfect role for you. Just like that, man. Ciro DePazio. He is the perfect example yep. of a person that you can look up to. He had a past. He went to prison. And now look at him now, man. He's making movies. He's making dreams come true. And me to go from where i was in a tent being miserable to wanting to kill myself to where i am now to loving life and doing what i love i would not change anything for nothing man That's i right. love my life now where it is and where it's going me, ne me neither i wouldn't change a thing it's snowing out there and we've got a few things to do today you know what i'm looking forward to driving in the snow putting the music on blasting you know you didn't have much selection in prison where i was and just like, holy crap, all these selections, you know, what is satellite radio? What the hell is that, you know? Just, look, we, yeah, we, you used to have the little clear clear Walkman thing, right? Yeah, when I got transferred, I was high escape risk from one state to another to put me in Supermax. For four years, I was in a Supermax. And so 
they said, oh, the feds are here for you. And I'm like, the feds? <laughs> so when I get in this transport, it was a private transport company with a blue light on the dash. And I, and I waited till we pulled out of the prison. I said, I'm not going to the feds, am I? I'm not a federal prisoner. They said, no, 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 we're just an extradition company, private, and we're taking you to this, you know, this other state, you know, whatever. And I'd learned, what, you know, why I was going there. It was kind of sprung on me. But anyway, so uh, the blue light was the Sirius radio, I guess. Had something to do with radio, the Sirius I don't know what it was. I don't know but, nothing about that. So they're playing like this country music. Now, I don't mind some of it, but I'm a Brooklyn guy. Like, you know, I like your club music, <laughs> you know, some R&B, some old school disco. I love that, you know. So I know some classic rock, but they're playing like, I think it was Alan Jackson's Freight Train, you know. And God bless Alan Jackson. He's a big star. But I don't know anything about Alan Jackson, right? And so I'm begging these guys, please turn this off. If I have a choice back here, like chained up for this long ride, you know, with three other guys. And they said, what do you want on? I said, Let's put some old school disco. I said, we ain't playing no effing disco in this truck. <laughs> That's funny, so, man. Yeah, you know, the tour. The what, tour state, what, what state were they from? Um, I forget where they come. I think their offices might have been based in Florida, but they were taking me from Florida to Virginia to a Supermax. If, if somebody's in like a gang leadership role or severe escape risk, they were moving people to other states. We, we talked about this before, how like even Connecticut inmates um, that – that, you know, for overcrowding reasons, made contracts with Virginia to take. Yeah, we're sent down there. They were trading inmates and things yeah, like that. We had a guy come from Chicago that was one of the top rank leaders of his organization, who ended up there, and he ran into other guy who was there from somewhere else. Turned out both of them were cooperating and th didn't know it, and that's why they were moved. And they like wanted to kill each other there until they figured out that they both cooperated, and then then they just stopped talking to each other. It was weird, weirdest dynamic because you don't know who's the hell is going to show up. You know? I should do a show like that, man. Where when they put rivals in the same jail, they do that on purpose sometimes. sometimes. On They'll purpose, take yep. from a rival from a rival town and put them in that jail just to mess with the people. The public it's doesn't crazy. realize that the Department of Corrections in virtually every state, and like I said, there's good ones. I ran to some very nice officers, administrators. They don't give a crap if you live or die. They will create controversy. They will create conditions so that people rebel against the food or the medical care, inadequate medical care. They create the exact conditions that create a problem so they can then go run to their legislature and to the public, we need more money for corrections. The prisons are out of control. Well, if you're abusing yeah. people 24-7 like they did in Attica back in the day, you're going to have a negative reaction. You can only keep kicking a caged animal for so long. And normally most of those bigger uprisings are because of the abuses that administrations inflict on the prisoners. We had no COVID in my prison. We were doing great. We had a warden. We had no assistant warden. We were doing great. There was outbreaks all over the state, guys dying everywhere. New assistant warden came. He's really over security. And he says, oh, you guys haven't had a shakedown because of COVID for a year? Yeah, but we're one of the few uh, completely COVID-free prisons. He says, I don't care. He locked it down. He brought officers from other facilities into our prison. Massive outbreak ensued, people dying all over the place because they brought a new assistant warden there who didn't give a crap about human life. And people started dying. That's how it goes, man. That's how it is. Yeah, it's, and people, the public don't realize how horrible They don't care until their son gets there, until their daughter is there. Then they suddenly care. Yeah, then they'll, they'll be right in the legislature. Legislator. That's why right? I can't I can't support Ron DeSantis, even though I lean more Republican. I can't support him in any way because he had the ability to let out nonviolent offenders that were charged free during COVID and make room, put them on house arrest, let them go home if they had no disciplinary charges. Other states were doing that during COVID to make room to save lives. DeSantis says basically, I don't care. They can serve their sentences. He came public. People were dying everywhere. They didn't have any reason to die. He didn't care about human life. I hope he never becomes president. You know, I, I can't support Ron DeSantis. I told Ignacio he feels the other way about him. I said, Ignacio, you were law enforcement. I lived under his rule. Trump 2024. <laughs> I'm going for Trump, man. It's either brilliant. Trump or me. <laughs> William I'm Steele, all in, man. I'm all in. <laughs> so, so, you know, look, my, my platform would be if I run for president, look, you already know I'm a criminal. Been there, done that. <laughs> What else can Give I do wrong? Give me your money. You know <laughs> right. I'm a criminal. If Give I need an money. advisor, if I need a good advisor, I go to people like Ignacio Esteban or uh, maybe yeah. even Donald Trump Jr. or Donald Trump himself. But uh, I think I could do a better job than a lot of these people that got in office. And you already Probably know I'm, I'm a screw up. So how much worse could it get? <laughs>
True yeah, that, bro. Ronald Reagan in there. They all become. You all find out about their dirt when they're in there. My dirt's coming out ahead of me. Here's all my dirt. Yeah, yeah. Me for president. <laughs> 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 Screw it, man. Yeah. So, all right, Bill. Is there anything else you'd like to share with us? I know you have a swag store now, which I'm getting mine going here. But uh, yo, mob you. swag. I'll, I'll send you the link for that, man. You can put it in the description. I got hoodies there. Uh, Absolutely. Uh, beanies there's coffee mugs things like that go check out the store and i'm trying to get it going mob swag you know all my fans of ma to roommate and on my my uh, channel please support bill he's been a good friend to me since i've been out of prison he's like i said he's helped me navigate this world of uh editing by the way how do you learn editing skills so well you're, you're phenomenal i was uh i was really into music back in the day and I, I know how to edit music so i just took my music editing skills and i put it towards the videos and it worked out great man. right <laughs> for any fans who are starting up a podcast or a, a true crime channel anything that needs editing bill does have that as a sideline business so i ask you to re you put your link in your description that you'll help people with their editing for a nominal fee i'm sure but uh yeah. he, he's excellent you watch how this video turns out this man's incredible, and I just wish I had his skills. But uh, he's he's blessed me because he know no, I came out of prison with nothing. So he'll help people who who need the help, but he also does it for a living. So look out for Bill. Definitely, man. Thank yeah. you. I just want to give a shout out to my mom, Dukes. I want to give a shout out to my sister. She's having a baby. I'm going to be a new uncle. Congratulations. And uh, shout out to my brother, and shout out to everyone who comes on chat with Stacks. I appreciate all of you. And a lot more stuff to come in the future. Thank yeah. you. Subscribe to Chat Chatting with Stacks. And also, William Steele True Crime on YouTube, all across social media. We're blowing up on Rumble. Rumble's an incredible platform. Subscribe, it's free, or whatever. What do you call it? Download the app. All free, and it's like YouTube, but better. They don't moderate as much, and they drive the videos like crazy to the proper audience. TikTok's another one. I just noticed that guy... Uh, uh, Tan Throck Silvernail, he makes incredible videos about my show. He said, did you yeah. realize your show has 10.5 million on hashtags on TikTok? I didn't know that. That's I just crazy. saw it. I learned that two days ago, and it's like at the top of this hashtag thing, it says, inmate to roommate, 10.5 million. And my picture's all throughout all these video clips. And I'm like, wait a minute. I got to find a way to cash in on this. Stay on track, man. That's the only, <laughs> only advice I have for you. Stay on track and don't get sidelined, man. The biggest cash in is being able to help people. So that's the cash in. But I do want to earn a living at the same time. You have yeah. to, We have to do that to keep our nose clean. And uh, hey, look, man, we're proud of you for what you've accomplished. You know, I've, I've tracked you for a while. Even before I invited you on, I said I want to make sure that he's really, you know what I mean? Because we don't know yeah. each other, but I see a pattern and you're so open about your past that I know you're doing the right thing. And you know what? Even if we fall once or twice, it's not a matter of fall. It's a matter of how we pick ourselves up and just keep on moving forward, man. I, I wish you all the best, Bill. Thank you for coming on my show. Please, guys, all my fans, subscribe to his channel. Help him build his channel up and buy his mob swag. Thank you for joining Will, William Steele, True Crime. This is going to go out as a podcast. Subscribe to my podcast, my channels. And thank you for watching Inmate to Roommate. Shout out to TMZ. For all your support and having me and Mary on uh, repeatedly. Thank you very much, everybody. Have a nice night. Peace. This is William Steele. Thank you for joining us. We appreciate your support. Please remember, hit the like and subscribe button now.